<clears throat> da, 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 na, 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 na. Hello, Science Alliance. Hello, I am Lara. This is the Lego Storytime Science Show, where I tell you all about a thing that I learned this week, and then we do a Lego Storytime Show. Uh, and this week I've been learning about bioluminescence. Brandon, this was your suggestion, as well as many other people's suggestion. Very, very good suggestion. Excellent. And another quick shout out the future. I hope the future is bright and lovely. Right, bioluminescence. I had to learn a lot of new words to do this show because I, I knew about fluorescent things. To be honest, I didn't really understand the science of it. And I knew about like glow in the dark things, which I've learned is called phosphorescence. So first of all, we talk about, we need to talk about what bioluminescence actually is and what it is not. So if you've got a highlighter and a duvet, you can do this activity with me. Although be careful, don't get highlighter on your duvet. Don't get me told off, right? We've got a highlighter pen here. And I've also got a glow in the dark thing. You may have brought something with you that glows in the dark. They both work in, in a kind of quite a similar way, right? You know atoms, don't you? We've learned about atoms before. Atoms, tiny little positive particles with negative particles whizzing around the outside. In all our um, periodic table lessons, we were learning about how electrons, these tiny little particles whizzing around the outside, they actually come in different things that scientists call shells. Basically, what, fluore what this fluorescent pen is doing and what's happening when things glow in the dark is an electron in the atom is absorbing light. Like obviously there's, there's light shining on this pen right now. So some kind of light is shining on the atom and it's getting the electron excited. So the electron sort of goes up a level and then drops down a level. And when the electron drops down a level, you get light, a little package of light is given off. I'll show it a different colour. There we go. Um, so yeah, that's, that's essentially what's happening. It's just electrons in atoms getting excited, giving off light. Right, so if you've got a glow-in-the-dark thing and a torch, you can do this with me. I'm just going to, luckily, just in time for these lessons, I bought a very bright bike light. So I'm going to shine a bright light onto this glow-in-the-dark slipper, which my kids grew out of years ago, but I love them and they're very useful for science purposes, so I'm keeping them. And I've also got a fluorescent pen. We're going to go on what people on Facebook were calling a field trip. Oh, it's so exciting. Into my uh, washing washroom. Because my washroom is a cupboard with no windows that is totally dark. So when we go in there, I want you to tell me, what are we going to see? If I take my highlighter pen and my glow-in-the-dark slipper into my completely pitch black washroom, what are we going to see? Laundry room, that's the word I was looking for, isn't it? What, what, are we, what, what do you think? It's only one. Let's go. Turn that off. Right. Quick, quick, before the glowing runs out. Is that a thing? We'll find out. We'll find out. Ooh. Field trip, field trip. Oh, so exciting. Right, here we are. So, because we don't know what's going to happen, so I'll show you, I'll put the camera here straight so uh, you know where the things are when the lights go off. There's the highlighter pen on the right. There's the glow-in-the-dark slipper on the left. What are we going to see? I'll turn the light off. <gasps> Gasp! Is that what you were expecting? So you can't see the fluorescent pen at all. I'm, I'm waving it in front of the slipper so you can see the outline of it. There's, there's no light coming from that fluorescent pen. But the glow-in-the-dark slipper is, as you probably predicted, it is glowing. Why? Wherefore? What's the difference? I, can you tell I've got my, I just found this out voice on. Well, Fluorescence, like the highlighter pen, means that light is given off straight away. It only happens when there's light there to excite the electrons. And I've put not a chemical reaction for reasons which will be obvious later. So the highlighter pen is, is emitting light. Come here, right? So we have talked about in, uh, we talked in our IGCSE physics lesson this week, how when you see things, it's because light is reflecting off them into your eyes, okay? So red light is bouncing off this bit of this robot box and into my eyes, and that's why I can see it. Fluorescent things go a little bit further. They are actually, like this pen right now, is not just reflecting light, it's giving off light. Those little packages of light caused by those electrons, it is giving them off, but it only happens when light is shining on it. So when there's no light shining, you don't see light anymore. That's what just happened, right? But this slipper is called, it's phosphorescence is what hap is happening there, which is basically the same, but it emits light more slowly. And that's what a glow in the dark toy is. Bioluminescence is neither of them. <laughs> it's, a, it's a chemical reaction, more like a glow stick. 
So I had a look on the internet to see if I could find, because I had a vague memory, because I, you know, I do obviously see a lot of researching science experiments online uh, for my job. I had a vague memory of reading about how you could make light with sugar. So I searched for that and I found this brilliant website, thank you, Bang Goes the Theory on the BBC, telling you all different ways that you can, you can produce light in your home. So, this is not terribly advisable. Yeah, if you get sugar, they're saying use sugar cubes or demerara sugar, and you crush them with a glass, that doesn't sound safe, but if you crush them in a dark room with a glass, then you, the sugar gives off light. We don't even really know the science behind it. It's something to do with like the electrons and the protons coming apart and then quickly getting back together again. Um, but it's, it's closer to bioluminescence than the glow-in-the-dark stuff, right? Um, and then I went down and it turns out there's a few different things you can do. You can take a brand new rubber band and stretch it. The whole band should very briefly glow. I don't have a brand new rubber band. I'm not going to use them. I didn't want to buy them. It's plastic, isn't it? Um, you can get an envelope and rip the seal open. Or it said if you're really lucky, you can tear apart some duct tape and see a, a line of blue light. So I have got duct tape. And I have got Demerara sugar, because that's the one that they said worked for them. So let's go back into the laundry room. Full disclosure, this did not work this morning, <laughs> this morning's show. It didn't work at all. But I thought, it's only fair for you to also experience it not working. And I'll tell you what I'll do. I have got, as well as Demerara sugar, I've also got some, some waffle sugar. My husband is an expert waffle maker. So I'm going to put that there. And um, I didn't want to use a glass, that seemed dangerous, so I'm going to use this hammer. I'm going to turn the lights off, try and crush that Demerara sugar. In fact, if I leave the camera there, that's good, because then you know where to look. And then I'll try and crush the sugar cubes, and we'll see if we can get some light. <sighs> now, I don't know if some of you know this, we've talked about this before, how the, you've got different cells in your eyes that detect light. And the ones that help you see in the dark take quite a long time to warm up, to adjust. So my eyes like at the moment i can just see pitch black but if i stayed in this cupboard for half an hour i'm not going to but if i did i'd be able to see a lot more detail so if you're doing this at home really you should go somewhere dark and then stay there for as long as you can bear to get your eyes used to the dark and then you'll have more chance of detecting this light okay i'm feeling the demerara sugar with my hand i have got a hammer hovering above it you hear that here we go, I'm just gonna smack it down and we'll see if, if we're the lucky ones. You ready? I think I'm just, <laughs> I should have said to keep your hands over your ears. Sorry, this might be a bit noisy. I couldn't see anything. I'm gonna watch this back in slow motion afterwards. You ready? I'll do the demerara again. Right, let's try the, um, let's try the waffle sugar. Over here, there we go. Okay, you ready? Three, two, hands over your ears if you don't like loud noises. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. <sighs> well, at least we all got to fail together. You know, failing is still still good science. All right, I've got my duct tape here. You can't see it, but it is right in front of the screen. I'm just gonna pull the duct tape apart. You ready? You ready for the amazing blue line? Three, two, one. <laughs> oh, I said it this morning and I will say it again. This, I think, is probably the weirdest thing we've ever done in data science. And it, it is quite a high bar. <sighs> well, uh, you can have fun with that in your own, t in your own time. <laughs> let's, let's talk about bioluminescence, shall we? <laughs> So bioluminescence is a chemical reaction that occurs in some living things that allows them to give off light. It doesn't happen in mammals and it doesn't happen in plants. Let's get that out of the way. Um, it usually happens, it most often happens in the sea, which is why I'm obviously dressed as a bioluminescent sea creature. So I thought we'd start with how bioluminescence happens or uh, occasions where it happens on land. Um, I have some pictures of some fireflies here, but when I tried to show it this morning, all you could see was my reflection. And you know what? I haven't solved that problem. So that's still all you can see. Sorry, you, you get it, right? It's a tree. All these little dots are fireflies. So, yeah, fireflies. They're like beetles with lights on their bums. Yeah? You've seen them in cartoons, right? 
There is one kind of firefly in the UK if you are in the UK like me and it is called the glow worm and I, I think it'll be glowing pretty soon. You have to look it up. If you go to hedgerows, you, you can see fireflies in the UK. Um, but yeah, for, I, I watched a whole David Attenborough documentary about it just the other day for this show and I was amazed. So fireflies communicate with each other, like to find a mate specifically, using their glowy signals. So where David Attenborough was, there were loads of different species and the different species all gave off different signals. And it was a bit to do with the rhythm of the light, but it was also to do with how they moved. So some move from side to side and the same species, but the opposite sex, like a male would be like, ah, oh, there's a female. I'll go see what she wants. Um, and some of them moved up and down. And yet yeah, sometimes it was the timing. So a female would flash and then the male would wait four seconds and then flash back. And then if the female flashed back straight away, it was like saying, yeah, come over here, firefly, let's make some baby fireflies. Um, but apparently the male firefly was judged not just on how bright the light was, but also on the timing. So it had to have really good timing, like count exactly four seconds to show that it was kind of genetically good and therefore the female would want to mate with it. Brilliant. I didn't know that fireflies had tough timing. That pleased me greatly. Also, there's a female firefly that deliberately sends off a signal that isn't for her species. So this female firefly, right, it's not trying to attract a male to mate with it because it's a male of a different species. Why would a female firefly want a male of a different species to come over to eat it, it turns out. Oh, isn't nature brilliant? So it, yeah, it gives off this certain signal and the male comes over thinking it can mate and then just gets swallowed. This female one also goes to spider's webs, blinds the spider with its lighty bum and steals food from the spider's web. I'm telling you, oh, I mean, just nature, so inspiring. Um, there's also a story of a woman in France, like quite recently, like in the last 20 years, I think, who, was looking for her dog in the garden at night and found it digging a hole and looked into the hole and there were glowing worms, like glowing blue worms, bioluminescent worms. And she told everyone, no one believed it because this species of worm was known to be in France like for years and years and years. No one had ever seen it do this because like no one had been out at night digging a hole. And if they were, obviously they had lots of bright lights probably, like if they were, you know, working. So I just thought, what a great example of how even nowadays, you can still discover things that no other human has done, discovered. Pretty cool. Right, but anyway, let's talk about the ocean. 76% of the fish that swim or the creatures that live in the open ocean bioluminesce. 76% of them just make light and 40% of the ones that live on the ocean floor give off light. It is incredibly common. The reason for the difference is, and this is important for when we go and do another activity in my laundry room in a sec, um, the ocean looks blue from above because it's scattering blue light. But actually, if you go down into the ocean, there's also only blue light there. We've been talking about this in our other lessons. This is why, Brandon, this is an excellent time to do this show. Um, red light has got a very long wavelength and it just gets absorbed by the water. So all the colours of the rainbow hit the water and only, oh, look at this, smooth, only the blue gets through and the red is absorbed by the water, okay? So fish and other sea creatures have evolved to only see blue light because there's no red light there. What's the point in seeing red light on the bottom of the ocean? The red light hasn't got there, it's been absorbed at the surface, okay? So fish have evolved to only really see blue light. Um, and they've, uh, yeah, I think that's, all right, no more spoilers for the activity. Um, but it's a really good way for them to communicate, okay? Because blue light travels the furthest in the ocean as well. So in the open ocean, if you can send a blue signal to your friend, that's a good way of communicating. On the, on the ground, like the sea bottom, not so much because there's rocks and stuff, so that's why not as many of them bioluminesce. But that's why most creatures in the sea bioluminesce in blue, because it's the blue that they have evolved to see. Why would you see red light? It's not there. Right, let's talk a little bit about the different ways that they use their bioluminescence in the sea, and then we'll go back in my laundry room. <laughs> Here's a hatchet fish. What a beautiful thing. Hey, look at that. That's a drawing of a hatchet fish that someone did in 1877, um, 1877. Just stunning. So how the hatchet fish uses its bioluminescence is a lot of animals in the ocean hunt from below. So the shark generally 
goes below its prey and then like surprises them from below. So obviously, if you imagine you're a shark and you're looking up, you can see the kind of light of the surface and the hatchet fish would show up as a nice little silhouette against the sort of surface of the ocean, which is light. So you'd be able to see it really easily. So what the hatchet fish does is it bioluminesces its belly so that it kind of blends in with the light around it so the shark can't see and eat it. I know, good eh? Here's another one, here's your classic. What do you think of when you think of bioluminescence? Anglerfish. So this is the female, the massive female. The male is just teeny tiny, like clings to the female all its life and then dies. It's pretty sad from a human perspective. Um, but yeah, this is the lure, the very famous angler fish lure that glows brightly and attracts other fish and then it gets eaten by these massive jaws. Um, the angler fish cannot actually bioluminesce. Yeah, no, I know, you can drop that in at dinner parties. It doesn't bioluminesce, it's got bioluminescent bacteria on its lure. It's what's called a symbiotic relationship. So the bacteria enjoy hanging out. <laughs> what a great place to live. The bacteria enjoy hanging out there because they get food from the anglerfish. And obviously the anglerfish uses the light to attract prey. It's good, eh? Um, and if you've seen beautiful pictures of like the whole ocean seeming to be kind of glowing um, and indeed sometimes bioluminescence on the sort of surface of the ocean can be seen from space sometimes that is where there's been a big plankton bloom so lots of little tiny plants have grown and then died and that's the bioluminescent bacteria eating the plankton that can be seen or sometimes it's a teeny tiny bit of algae. Um, but anyway, yeah, it's quite unusual for sea creatures to have that symbiotic relationship. Here's another one that does it. The lantern shark, world's smallest shark. Um, so the lantern shark has bioluminescence around its eyes. And that is also bacteria. It's farming bacteria under its eyes. Um, so that it can communicate with other lantern fish, but also so that it can light up the seabed so that it can see its food. I know, it's just got searchlights. It's just, yeah, brilliant. Um, this brittle star, picture time. Here we go, that's a brittle star and me. Sorry, the black screen isn't working, is it? Oh yeah. What this thing does, if it's getting attacked by a predator, then it bioluminesces a bit of its arm and then that bit of the arm breaks off and drifts away into the ocean. And then the thing that's trying to kill it, like a kitten with one of those little torches, is just like, ooh, 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 and chases after the thing that's lit up, and then the dark, brittle star just sneaks away. How brilliant is that? Ugh. Right, last one, the stoplight fish. The name is a clue if you speak American. In American, they call the red light of a traffic light a stoplight. Here is a stoplight fish. What a thing, what a creature. Amazing. So this thing, you remember me saying that fish in the very, very bottom of the ocean, like the twilight zone, about 2000 meters down, they have evolved to not see red light because red light can't get down that far. Um, they've also evolved to be red because being red is the same as being dark. This stoplight fish is the only fish that I've heard of that gives off bioluminesces in red light. All the other fish are giving off blue light because that's the light that your mates can see. Why would a stoplight fish bioluminesce in red and give off red light? Well, time to come into my laundry room, folks. Let's solve this problem. So, <clears throat> get this detritus. Um, so here we've got two fish. If you've been to my uh, free, as everything is, all ages lesson on colour, this will be starting to make sense to you. So this is the bottom of the ocean, right? We've got two fish, red and blue. I've told you that fish on the bottom of the ocean tend to be red. They don't tend to be blue. I will say that again. Fish living right on the bottom of the ocean, they tend to be red. So we've been looking at in our colour lesson how if you see something red, yeah, it's because that thing is reflecting red back into your eye. Um, there's obviously only blue light on the bottom of the ocean. So if you shine blue light onto a red thing, what happens? Let's do it. So if you haven't seen my All Ages lesson, uh, I haven't got a blue light, but I have got a white bike light. <laughs> Oh, I'll put it in my pocket, 
that was clever. I've got a white bike light and I've got a blue bowl, which we're going to use as a blue filter <laughs> because no funding. So let's make a blue light and see what happens. Oh, look at that. How good is that? So the red fish only reflects red light and there's no red light hitting it. There's only blue light hitting it. So the red fish is absorbing all the blue light and just appears black. It's almost completely blended into that black background, hasn't it? Whereas the blue fish is standing out a mile because it reflects blue light and it's got a load of blue light on it. This is why, oops, I'm not lit up. Um, wait, that's my laundry room, sorry. <laughs> This is why you don't tend to get blue fish on the bottom of the ocean because there's blue light down there and if they were blue then they would stand out a mile to their predators. So I've just told you that the lantern fish gives off red light. Why would it give off red light? Let's see. Put it down here. Turn this white light off. Get my red bike light on. Oh, gasp! Look, the opposite has happened. So the, the red fish, which thought it was so cannily camouflaged at the bottom of the ocean, is now standing out a mile. Clever old lanternfish, eh? So it's giving off red light, so suddenly it can see its prey really easily. Amazing. And incidentally, the blue fish, which doesn't exist, has gone black. Pretty good, eh? Let's turn that off. And come here with me once more. Nearly story time. <coughs> my garden. <laughs> You're getting a, a full tour of my house today. Of course the other brilliant and horrifying thing about that is that fish on the bottom of the ocean have only evolved to see blue light. They can't see red light so they don't even know that that stoplight fish is lighting them up with red light and that they can easily be seen. Ugh. They can't see it and they don't know that they can be seen. It's so creepy. It's like if Someone who could see radio waves was shining all over radio waves onto us and, and looking at us really clearly, but we wouldn't know that they were there because we can't see radio waves. It's freaking me out just thinking about it. Uh, so yes, that was a stoplight fish, a type of dragon fish. Whew. I think it's time for story time. It is. It is time for story time. The ocean, what a brilliant and, and terrifying place it is. <coughs> Here we go. <laughs> <coughs> Sometimes, inspiring little moments happen that can change your life forever. And they can happen at any age. I was 28 and an out-of-work actor who thought physics was boring when I saw a Brian Cox programme on TV and thought, wow, physics isn't boring. I want to teach that. Edith Widder, for example, was 11 and she thought school was boring. Then she travelled to Fiji with her parents, saw a coral reef and thought, wow, this is totally amazing. This is what I want to do for the rest of my life. I want to learn how to be a marine biologist. And uh, she did. She learned biology at school. And then she learned biology at university. And then she got a master's at university. And then she got a doctorate at university, which is like the highest thing you can get. And she became a marine biologist. Yay! So she worked during her early career as a marine biologist with lots and lots and lots of different vehicles. And she noticed something. She noticed that different vehicles gave off different noises and that that seemed to affect what fish they saw if she was in a very noisy vehicle kind of makes sense to us now but no one had really thought about this before she didn't see that many fish and uh, and this inspired her right and then she had another very inspiring moment in 1989 she was in a johnson sea link submersible this is not for once by the way me messing, me hashing up my Lego. This is an actual Lego model of a Johnson Sea Link submersible. It's got these robot arms so that it could collect samples from the bottom of the sea and put them into storage. Uh, and, it, and it did have this like spherical glass dome on it. Right, so she was in one of these. She'd been told to return. It was time for the people at the surface to go for their tea and she was gonna be very unpopular. But just at the last second before she was coming up, she saw an incredibly rare animal. It was so rare, she would never see it again in her life. And she'd never seen it before. It was a pelican eel. 
Um, and it, it swam around in front of her and then it ballooned up into a massive ball, which she says she didn't think anyone had ever seen before. No one knew it could do that. And then it bioluminesced. Here's an X-ray of one. Isn't that absolutely incredible? The pelican eel. Um, and this inspires her. She thought, I'm going to build something that allows people to observe ocean animals properly without all this terrible noise that these vehicles are making. And design it, she did. Um, so she designed a camera that could be lowered down. It was battery powered. There was no motor, no noise, no vibrations. And if you're going to create something that won't disturb sea creatures, where's the best place to go for inspiration? Sea creatures. So like the stoplight fish, Edith's camera only gave off red light. That hadn't been done before. People had only been looking at sea creatures using white light on the bottom of the ocean. Um, and it also had a blue light-up lure attached to the camera, which she'd specifically designed. It was like a digital light display that looked like the signal, the bioluminescence given off by a common deep-sea jellyfish. They called it the e-jelly. Uh, just a note, that wasn't because she wanted to observe animals that ate sea jellies. This is... Um, <laughs> the eight jellyfish. It's quite a common thing that creatures of the ocean do. Uh, a jellyfish gives off a signal so that it'll attract a bigger animal that might eat the thing that is eating it. So it's a very, very clever idea. Um, she called her camera the eye in the sea and she was sure that it would allow her to silently observe life in the twilight zone. So she went to the National Science Foundation, told them all about it, says, I've had this absolutely brilliant idea. I'm very, very confident. I think it's, it's going to be great. And the National Science Foundation said, um, what are you going to discover with this thing? And she said, well, I don't, I don't know. That's the point, actually. I think we've been scaring everything the way, the way we've been doing it before. And they said, uh, no, not for us. Sorry. She tried loads of places that said no. In the, uh, in the end, someone took it on, but she had to scrape together $30,000 herself. It was a real uphill battle, she said. But anyway, build it, she did. Here's the real thing. Yeah. Um, it had a rope on it, 600 metres long, which hung off a float into the deep sea. It just moved with the currents, just this silent camera. She was so excited. She finally had a window into the deep sea. And she finally got to test it off the coast of Mexico. Let's go down to the deep sea. Up, yup. Yeah, there we go. So she said it was really, really scary watching this thing that she'd worked so hard on be just lowered down into the ocean. But obviously that's what it was there for. Um, she designed it so that it would just sit on the bottom of the ocean overnight at first with a, a red light on because she just wanted to see if the red light would disturb the fish. And then she designed it so that right at the end, the e-jelly would come on. Um, so it got pulled up again and she went off on her own to look at the footage. And she said at first, she only she found the film exciting, really, the first bit, um, because the fish, it turns out, weren't scared of the red light. So she had great footage of, you know, fairly run-of-the-mill fish swimming around, swimming up right up to the camera. They weren't bothered by the red light. Fantastic. And then she got to the bit of the film where the blue e-jelly signal got turned on. And... 86 seconds after that e-jelly signal getting turned on, a squid appeared on the camera that was completely new to science. No one had ever seen this squid before. Nobody knew it existed. It wasn't just a new species of squid. It belonged to a whole new family of squid. <laughs> Edith was absolutely ecstatic. Hooray! Do you know what? This is actually going to make you loads of money. She had discovered something new. That's not why she was excited. But when she went back to the National Science Foundation and said, there you go, that's what I'm going to discover. They said, woohoo, have half a million pounds. So she used that money to build an even better, newer camera. And the next trip she did with that bigger, amazing camera discovered, well, captured on film for the very first time ever footage of a giant squid. <laughs> uh, she caught, oops, she caught a giant squid on film for the first time ever. Uh, the pictures 
obviously made the international news. Edith says, we've only explored 5% of the ocean. We've spent a tiny fraction of what we've spent on space travel on exploring the sea. We need NASA-like organisations for ocean exploration. Let's all go exploring, says Edith, but do it in a way that doesn't scare the animals. The end. Edith Widow, everyone. What an absolute legend. Um, after this, quite a lot of you are following me on Facebook. In my Facebook group, which is where all the lesson free printouts go, um, I'll put a link to... She's done loads of TED Talks, loads of brilliant TED Talks. I'll put a link to them um, so that you can see her talking about it herself because obviously that's ideal and she's absolutely amazing she's uh, she's my one of my heroes right you lot that is the end of the bioluminescence show i hope that you enjoyed it um i'm just going to go over to my facebook page because when i'm live on youtube i always put a post on facebook saying if you're watching live you can always comment on here wow look at all these comments amazing so thank you if you've commented i'm about to read your comments if you haven't commented uh, this might, bit might be a bit boring for you and you might wish to go um before you go consider paying me for my job <laughs> this is such an amazing job so everything that i do is free like all the online content is free um there's worksheets for the home ed lessons and the igcse physics lessons and this lego show that i do every week in term time it is only possible uh, because people are paying me five pounds a month if people were not supporting me per month i would have to be like a teacher in a classroom Ugh. so if you go to this oh wait it's youtube i can write forwards if you go to this website called coffee or if you search coffee theatre of science, then uh, it, you, it will allow you to support me with a small amount per month. And I will send you thank yous because I will be so grateful. I will send you some rainbow glasses and make you see rainbows. I'll send you Theatre of Science magazine every time I've written it. I'm frantically writing a new one now. Um, yeah, I'm very proud of Theatre of Science magazine. Husband graphically designs it. It's got comics. It's got... Um, this one's got a choose your own adventure. It's all about mold. I send you a free biodegradable plastic bag so you can grow your own mold and then identify it using the mold guide. I'm just very proud of it, that's so nice. Thank you very much to everyone who is paying my wages. Right, let's go to the comments. And all comments Facebook, I wanna see them all. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Excellent. <laughs> oh, hello, Tony. Right. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Bella, are you telling me that the Iron Sea has a webcam? Hello, Suki and Arthur and Eunice and Salah. Hello, it's Science Day. I know, it's my Science Day as well. Oh, hello, Harrison. Oh, Harrison's got glowworms in the garden. No way. Is that is that because they're lighting up right now? I meant to look into it before I did this lesson and then I forgot. It must be the time. Is this the time? Oh, I need to start going into my garden very late at night. We are giggling that you have pasta in your laundry room. <laughs> Yeah, I could, I don't know, maybe I've got a washing room in my pantry, uh, washing machine in my pantry. You are very blurry today. Oh, sorry. Oh no. Ah. Mm. Oh, hello Imogen and Ophelia. Hello, you're in Science Day. I love, I love it when you guys have Science Day. Oh, Rosa will be watching live. Rosa, if you've made it this far, I'm very impressed. But hello, Rosa. Hello. Thank you for coming. Bella, GNR. Nice. Is that your new nicknames? GNR otherwise known as grrr, science. Hello, Sam. Our mind has been blown by the sneaky female firefly that uses its, its flashing bum to dazzle its prey. I know, right? Basically, it's teaching us to eat our friends' partners. Mm, yeah, yeah, that's right. Hello, Ethan. Hello, Sky and Evie. Yeah, science day. The eye in the sea has a webcam. What? And Bella has actually linked to this webcam. Amazing. I didn't even know the eye in the sea was still out there, keeping its eye on the sea. Amazing. Can access on the TV. Brilliant. Oh, wait, I see you're telling someone else. That's good. <laughs> Earwax thingy, yes. No, the eye of the sea. Okay, right, I'm just pulling it up now so that we can all see what's happening. It's not live, surely. News of the eye of the sea, the world's first webcam. No. That was 2009. It can't be live now, but apparently I'm still online and I'm just still Googling it because it's amazing. Let's go to the homepage of, oh yeah, here we go. No, I don't think I'm actually gonna find their webcam, but this does seem like a great website. Okay, right, anyway, 
I'm gonna go. I'm gonna post all those uh, links and YouTube videos and things into the Facebook group that I told you that I would. Thank you so much for your support, you lot. I will see you next week for another lesson. We've got loads and loads of amazing topics to do. Uh, I'll put it, I'll put the advert up very soon. See you soon. Have a lovely, lovely weekend. Bye.